Good evening. Uh, Tonight's Bible reading will come from Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith, on the contrary. The man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Well, it's a great privilege to be able to, again, open up God's Word. Uh, As uh, most of you know, uh, Pastor Ian's still on leave uh, at the moment, and uh, he'll be back at the beginning of Feb. Uh, So please keep him in your prayers, just again, that this time off would be uh, really refreshing for him. Uh, He's had a really big year, uh, many burdens to bear uh, last year. So keep him in your prayers, um, that he may come back refreshed, full of zeal, uh, to continue to serve God's people. Uh, If you have your Bible, uh, please keep it open to Galatians chapter 3. It was a it was a few months it was a few months back now when we were going through uh, our series in Joshua. We were in Joshua chapter 7 and uh, had to preach on the subject of sin in the camp uh, and the consequences that that brought. And I was forced to deal with the subject, uh, the unpopular subject of church discipline. Uh, which is very uncomfortable, uh, which many rage against at the moment. Um, but I can tell you honestly, I, I wasn't worried by that, and it didn't trouble me at all to speak on that subject. Two weeks ago, in the morning service, uh, looking at Titus 2, and one of the themes that came up was biblical womanhood. And one of the points that we needed to address was feminism in the culture and feminism that crept, uh, that's creeping into the church which is uh, considered a highly controversial subject, but it didn't trouble me at all to speak on it. But the passage that we have before us tonight absolutely terrifies me. Absolutely terrifies me. And the Lord knows this week. The Lord knows this week. Let's pray together and ask for his help. Father, you know, you know, and that is enough for me. Thank you for your word. Lord, we've come tonight to meet with you, to offer up worship to you as our God and as our Savior, and we've come to meet together. And Lord, we've come to hear you speak, and we pray that you would speak so clearly tonight, unmistakably, I pray for your help, Lord God. You know that I'm not up for this. And Lord, I pray that you would open up your word to us and that you might be pleased to transform us, to show us things of Christ that we may may have never seen before and things that are of utmost significance, things that are full of mystery, things that are full of wonder, things that are beyond us, things that should bring us to our knees. Lord, I pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit tonight. We desperately need him. Take your word and forever change us, we pray. Brand us with the ownership of Christ, we ask in his name. Amen. Well, when you consider the atonement, there are many aspects within the atonement, many metaphors to show the different facets within the atonement. It's multifaceted, it's complex. There's themes that come through such as sacrifice, ransom, the imagery of ransom and redemption, payment 
that was made on the cross. There's the theme of substitution. There are legal themes that, have to, uh, uh, that the atonement deals with. The justice of God being satisfied. The atonement involves victory. The theme of victory over Satan, over death. There's a, there's a theme of rescue and salvation. But there is one aspect of the cross that often gets overlooked or is greatly misunderstood. And it's the theme of curse, the curse of God. And this curse motif, as it were, runs throughout the Bible. The theme of, of the curse of God. Now, I want us to see, firstly, before we really jump into this text, the theme of God's curse throughout the Bible. Now, we may know one element of it, but it is layered. Now, cursing, to be cursed is the opposite of being blessed. When you see curses in the Scripture, they are often placed in contrast to blessings, to show what it means. So to understand what it means to be cursed by God, we need to understand what it means to be blessed by God. What does blessedness mean? What does it refer to? What does it mean to be under His blessing? Well, when we, get, when we go through the Scriptures, when Israel comes out of Egypt, the Exodus happens. Now, God gives Israel His law. And He says to them this, When you cross over the Jordan... Six of your tribes, you need to climb Mount Gerizim. Six of the tribe, half of you, and you to go up there. And I want you to stand on top of that mountain, and I want you to pronounce all of my blessings that will come upon those who obey me. So if you obey my law and keep my law, these are all the blessings that will come your way. Let me read some of these blessings that God promises. Deuteronomy 28, this is when it happens on the mountain. Verse 4, God says, The fruit of your womb will be blessed. The crops of your land and your livestock will be blessed. Verse 8, The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and everything you put your hand to. Verse 7, The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. And look how God sums up all of these blessings. This is how he sums it up, blessedness. Verses 3 and 6. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed will you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Do you see what he's saying here? You will be blessed in all things, in every aspect of your life. You will be blessed. When you put your head on the pillow, you will be blessed. When you wake up in the morning, you'll be blessed. When you head out to work, you'll be blessed. When you're at home, you'll be blessed. In the kitchen, blessed. In the yard, blessed. Everywhere you go, every relationship, you will be blessed. My blessing will rest upon you. It is to have The blessedness he refers to is to have God's favor upon you, resting upon you, the very favor of God. The blessedness of God is so much more than favor. The clearest example of what blessedness of God looks like upon a person or a people is found in that famous benediction that you know so well, the blessing that God pronounces upon Israel. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. And God says this, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his whole face towards you and give you peace. That is the blessedness of God. To have God absolutely for you. To have peace with God, to be a recipient of grace, to be in His keeping hands whom no one can snatch you from, to be at peace with God and for His face to be towards you, His face shining upon you. This is Him to pour His immeasurable love upon you as His own special possession. It is to have God for you and not against you. This is blessedness. The theme continues throughout the scripture. Jesus picks up on it on the most beautiful sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus picks up on blessing. And Jesus pronounces certain blessings upon certain people. The Beatitudes. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And then the pinnacle, the pinnacle of blessedness, he says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So you move from God's face shining upon you, his face towards you, to the pinnacle of blessing of you seeing one day the very face of God, the hope of glory, seeing him. This is blessedness. And so as we look at this, as I sum that up, Blessedness is to have the very favor of God resting upon you. It is to have God for you and not against you. It is to have his smile upon you, his immeasurable love upon you. It is to have peace with God. It is to be so blessed that one day you will see him. That is what it means to be blessed. And so, now, what does it mean to be cursed? What does it mean to be cursed? Cursing. The curse of God is always placed in contrast to the blessing of God. It is always opposite. Now, we don't really talk about curses today. We don't really think about it. If, if even the word of cursing and curses comes up today, we think of magic. We think of witches. We think of voodoo. We think of spells. That's nothing about what the Bible talks about regarding, regarding cursing. There is a dominant theme throughout Scripture of the curse of God. What is it? Well, you go back to the book of Genesis and the curse that you probably know very well. The first layer of the curse, Adam and Eve are deceived and they sin and God pronounces a curse upon the serpent and says the seed of the woman is going to come up and he will crush your head. God turns to the man and curses the man and said, and says, You've enjoyed working in the garden, but now you'll be outside the garden and the earth will be against you. And when you labor, it will produce thorns and briars. It will be hard to live. You will toil in sorrow and hardship. And then he turns to the woman and he says, your desire, he curses her and he says, your desire will be to rule over your husband, but he will dominate you. And on top of that, cursed will you be in childbirth, in excruciating pain will you bear children. Every woman who gives birth is under that curse. But the cursing continues. And obviously he pronounces the general curse on all humanity. The curse of death. We were made to live forever and now we're going to die. But that's really the first layer of cursing. And in church and in in Bible teaching, that's really as far as we go regarding God's curse. But you see the theme progress, and that's just the first layer. When Israel leaves Egypt, six tribes were on the Mount of Gerizim to pronounce the blessings for obedience. What happened to the other six tribes? Where were they? God says to the other six tribes, I want you to climb Mount Ebal. And I want you to stand on that mountain and I want you to shout from that mountain all of these curses that will fall upon those who disobey and break my law. Call out the curses now upon those who disobey me. Let me read some of those curses that fall upon the disobedient. Deuteronomy 28 verse 18. The fruit of your womb will be cursed. Your crops and your livestock will be cursed. Verse 20, the Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to. Verse 22, the Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, which will plague you till you are destroyed. Verse 28 to 29, the Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. At midday, you will grope like a blind man in the dark. And look how God sums up. All of these curses, look at the summary of it, verses 16 to 19. Cursed shall you be in the city, cursed shall you be in the country, cursed shall you be when you go out, and cursed shall you be when you come in. Do you see that? In everything you will be cursed. In all things you will be cursed. When you put your head on the pillow, you are under my curse. When you wake up in the morning, you're under my curse. When you go to work, you're cursed. When you come home, you're cursed. You're cursed in the kitchen. You're cursed in the yard. You're cursed in all of your relationships. Cursed, cursed, cursed by me. 
under my curse. This is to have God's complete displeasure towards you, to have his holy anger and his fury burning against you 24-7. This is to have him, God, God, not for you, but against you in everything of your life against you. It is the opposite of blessing. Jesus, who picked up on the theme of blessing and gave us that beautiful sermon, he also picks up the theme of cursing. In Matthew 23, Jesus, instead of using the word curse, he uses the word woe, which means curse. It is to pronounce a curse upon someone. Jesus uses the word seven times in Matthew 23. Listen to what he says to the religious leaders. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Woe, you sons of hell. Woe, blind guides, blind fools. Woe to you, you snakes, you brood of vipers. And then the curse reaches its pinnacle. And he says this, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Curses. What does it look like? to be under God's curse. What does it look like? Think about this. We just read what the greatest blessing is to be. The blessed state is, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. What does it mean to be cursed? Reverse every line of that promise. Reverse every single line of that, and then you get it. It's the opposite. May the Lord curse you, and may the Lord throw you out. May the Lord make his face burn with anger against you. May the Lord give you justice without grace. May the Lord hide his face from you, and may the Lord withhold peace from you, and may he terrify you with his furies. That is what it is to be under the curse of God. That is to be cursed by God. The Beatitudes is such a wonderful blessing. Blessed in the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What is it to be cursed? Blessed, uh, cursed are the impure in heart, for they shall not see God. It is the absolute opposite. Now this is hard to swallow. Because this is the God that is hidden from Christianity today. And we are ashamed of him. We're ashamed of him. And we hide him in the closet. Don't you dare let him out. Let me quote R.C. Sproul, who has been really helpful to me in thinking over this subject. Let me quote him. He says this, quote, Everywhere in this country you see automobiles with bumper stickers that read, God bless America. After 9-11, Pat Robinson and Jerry Falwell suggested that perhaps the events of 9-11 were God's judgments upon America. And the outcry and the outrage from the press was so severe, they had to recant their musings on that point. Because we believe in a God who is infinitely capable of blessing people, but is utterly incapable of cursing people. End quote. Do we believe in a God that both blesses people and curses people? Do you believe in a God that does that? The Bible teaches of such a God, and the Apostle Paul believed in such a God. And so we have our passage here. Our next point we see that Paul makes is that all humanity is under the curse of God. Look at verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Why is this world under the curse of God? Yes, because of what Adam and Eve had done. We're all going to die one day. We're all fallen. But why is Paul saying that we're under this curse that's more than just dying? Why does he say that? Because we have not continued to do everything in the book of the law. That's what he says there. We have broken God's law. We saw what God said on the mount, right? 
And he quotes that there. He says, We have not continued in everything in the book of the law, from the greatest commandments in the Bible to the least commandments. The entire breadth of it, we haven't kept it. We've broken it. I've broken it. I've broken it. I've broken it. James, in chapter 2, verse 10, says, Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. You see, God's law represents who He is. And the moment we break a law, we become offenders of the holy God. We have offended God. We have wronged Him. And we rightfully incur the judgment of lawbreakers. Habakkuk says, God, you are of eyes too pure to look upon sin. We have not kept his law. Now, who is the curse specifically referring to here in verse 10? Look carefully at Paul's words. Who does it specifically rest upon? Verse 10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. Now, we read that and we look at that and we assume that Paul is referring to the Jews here. The Jews were given the written law. And they were so meticulous in trying to keep every part of it. They gave their lives to try and fulfill and obey the whole law. True, these words apply to them. But these words also apply to Gentiles who have the law written upon their hearts. That's what Scripture says. You see, a person doesn't need to pick up a Bible to know the law of God. They do not. We know that it is a sin, it is wrong to steal. We know it is wrong to lie. We know adultery is wrong. We know selfishness is wrong. We know coveting is wrong. Because His law is upon our heart. Cursed are all those who rely on the law. Just about a week ago, speaking to a man outside the metro station, Filipino man, a husband and a father, we got in conversation I asked him I said do you know where you're going when you die are you going to heaven or are you going to hell and he said I don't know I said you don't know he said I hope I'm going to heaven so why do you think you're going to heaven because I try and do what is right I try and do the right thing do you know what he's saying I try and keep the law that God has written upon my heart He's relying on the law, and he's under a curse. I came in to Castle Hill as a newbie with no baggage, new to this church a few years ago, no prior relationships, which made it easy for me to freely have conversations with people. There's no baggage there. I don't know how long people have been serving in the church or what their reputation is. And in asking people certain questions and talking, And just presenting that hypothetical scenario. If you were to die tonight and you were to stand before the holy God and he looks at you and says to you in that moment as you were suspended between heaven and hell and he says to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And the answers, the answers. I've tried to do what God wants. I've tried to love God. I've tried to do to others what I would want done to me. I've tried to serve him. I have tried to keep the law. I have tried to be good and do what he has said. See, we look at verse 10, all those who rely on the works of the law under a curse. We think it's referring just to legalists. But we don't understand that we rely on the law so much, on our efforts. Some of you, some of you in this room tonight... During the week, you scarcely have a single thought about Christ. Your affections do not go after Him. They run after everything else. You find no delight in Him. And yet you know that the Bible commands us to meet together. And so you come to church on Sunday. And then you will leave the service Though you have spent the entire week completely careless of Christ, you will leave this service content that you have done your duty and have worshipped Him. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Are under a curse. And so we find ourselves under the curse of God. Do you remember? You saw in Deuteronomy 28, 
if you do not obey my law, all these curses will come upon you. And in verse 10, that's what Paul's quoting. That's where he's getting it from, Deuteronomy 28. All of us find ourselves under nothing less than the very curse of God. The curse of God. Let me quote Reich in here. He says this, The problem with the law then is not the law. The problem with the law is our sin. Since we cannot keep the law, the law cannot bless us. All it can do is curse us. End quote. Understand this. Know this. All those terrible curses that we read from Deuteronomy that were pronounced from Mount Abar, God shouts from heaven, sinners and lawbreakers, you sitting here, you are under my curse and my bow is ready and I have my target set. We are all prey and the hunter knows where we are. Every single one of us walks on the brink of hell. Under the curse. Under the curse. Do you hear him say, do you hear him say to you tonight, cursed, cursed, not blessing, cursed. I told you, this is a difficult passage. What can be done? What can be done for helpless people in this state? What can be done? I said at the beginning that this passage terrified me and it wasn't because of anything that I've said thus far. I've preached on sin many times from this pulpit. That's not what terrifies me. What terrifies me is the answer to this question. What can be done for such helpless people? Look at verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. May God help us to consider what that even means. What that means. He became a curse for us. It says there, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. That word there, redeemed, it means to purchase and pay the price to secure something. We are under the curse of the law and Christ pays the price to lift the curse off us. What is the cost of lifting the curse from us? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Have you ever read such terrible words as these? It doesn't say that he took the curse. He became a curse. Have you ever been so troubled by a statement in all of the years of your life than what is written before us in the Word of God. He became a curse for us. Now hold on just a second. Who is it that receives a curse? Who, who, who do the curses fall upon? We saw that the curse comes upon those who break the law of God. Christ never broke the law of God. It was actually his perfect obedience that kept him from the curse of the law that we had. So what's going on here? He was free from the curse. It couldn't touch him. How can he become a curse? Under God's curse. Look at all of verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. How did he become cursed? Through the manner in which he died. The method of his execution is what brought upon the curse. What made him a curse? Paul quotes here Deuteronomy 21. Let me read that passage for you. Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. What's going on here? 
If a, God says this, If a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but you shall bury him that same day. Why? For a hanged man is accursed by God. Cursed is everyone who is hung upon a tree. In the Old Testament, God says, If a man is hung on a tree, they are under my curse. They are cursed by me. Now Christ receives the Roman crucifixion, which is the equivalent of being hung on a tree. Christ was placed under God's curse because he was crucified and he hung on a tree. And he was cursed by God. Now think how blasphemous was this message to the Jews. You're saying the Messiah. You're saying the anointed one of God. You're saying God's son was cursed by God. Was cursed. Was the object of his anger. Absolutely. Notice though how the apostles didn't shrink back from this. But they embraced it and they preached the curse of Christ. Listen to how they draw attention in their preaching to the curse. Many times you'll find in the New Testament, they don't use the word cross when talking about Jesus' death. They use the word tree, drawing to Deuteronomy 21. Acts chapter 5, verse 30, Peter is preaching and he says this, The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. That's curse language. Peter, again in his letter, writes this, 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That's curse language. And Paul, when he is preaching, Acts 13.29, Paul says this, They took his body down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. You see, they recognized, they recognized that Christ became a curse for us. And this is why the gospel is so scandalous, because we believe in a cursed Messiah who became a curse, and it was preposterous to the Jews. That's why Paul says, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews. A stumbling block. Now, we can read that Christ became a curse, but what does it look like? What did it look like him becoming a curse? What did it look like for him? What did it feel like? What happened to him? Yes, we read it, but what happened? What did it look like, first of all? First of all, what was Christ wearing on that cross? What was he wearing on that tree? He was wearing a crown of thorns. They were designed to inflict much pain on him. They were designed to mock him as a fake ridiculous kind of king, but God meant it for so much more. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, the curse for sin is thorns, and God puts the symbol of the curse upon his brow, and God preaches from heaven, behold my cursed son. He's cursed, and he's paraded as a curse. Furthermore, to understand Christ cursed we have to go back to one of the most important days on the Jewish calendar. Leviticus chapter 16 teaches us about the Day of Atonement, the most important day of the year for the Jews. That day, one day a year, when the sins of the entire people of Israel were taken away through sacrifices, that one day. What happened on that day? What happened? The high priest was commanded to take two goats, the first goat was to be slaughtered and its blood was to be taken into the most holy place, the back room of the tabernacle, the place that only the high priest was allowed to enter and one day a year. And he is to take the blood of that goat and he is to sprinkle it upon the top of the Ark of the Covenant, which is the mercy seat. And as the blood is sprinkled upon that seat, God's anger is satisfied. God is propitiated. His anger is appeased against sin. But now, 
what happens to the sins of the people? What happens to the curse? There's a second goat. And the second goat is the climax of the event. The second goat isn't to be killed. It's to be kept alive. And the high priest is to go up to that goat and he's to place his hands upon the head of that goat. And it says very specifically, the high priest is to confess all the sins and all the wickedness of the people. And he is to put the sins and the wickedness of the people on the head of the goat. That's what it says. But then what happens? What's to happen to the goat? The high priest is to release the goat alive into the wilderness outside of the camp. What's going on here? Think, God repeatedly said, do not defile the camp because I dwell among you. My presence is in the camp. Do not defile it. And so God says, the animal with the sin upon it, the animal with the curse upon it, drive it outside of the camp and outside of my presence. What happened to Christ? What was it like for him to be cursed? Do you remember blessedness means to have God's face shining upon you? God's face shining upon you. What happened to Christ? Do you remember the curse in Deuteronomy 28? I read it before. Think about this. The curse said this, at midday you will grope about like a blind man in the dark. What do we read of in Matthew's gospel? Matthew tells us when Christ was on the cross, at midday darkness covered the land. The sun was so cursed. The son of God was so cursed. The sun in the sky forbade to shine. And darkness covered the land as God was preaching from heaven. My son is cursed. My son is cursed. What did it mean? What did it look like for Christ to be cursed? Remember, blessedness means for God to turn his face to you and give you peace. What happened to Christ on the cross? He was so abhorrent in the sight of God that it says God turned his face away and he could not look upon his son. And Christ, the cursed son, realizes and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As the father hides his face from his son, from his son. What did it look like for Christ to be cursed? Remember the curse in Deuteronomy chapter 28. God said this, Just as it pleased the Lord to prosper you, so it will please him to ruin and destroy you. What do we read of in Isaiah 53, the prophecy about Christ on the cross? It says this in verse 10, And it pleased Yahweh to bruise him and make him suffer. It pleased the Father to bruise him, to crush him, to bring him to ruin. How could the Father do that to his Son? Because he became a curse. He became a curse for us. He was cursed by God. He was cursed by God. How could God send all these curses upon his son? What does God say at the end of all the curses in Deuteronomy? He says this, this is the reason why the curses will come upon you. All these curses will come upon you. They will pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed. Why? Because you did not obey the Lord your God. The only one, the only one of us whoever obeyed the Lord God with all their heart, soul, mind and strength in complete perfection, all the curses of God are unleashed upon him. Upon him. Upon his head. Christ stood as the man. As the man. He stood before God as all the murderers. As all the adulterers, as all the liars, as all the thieves as all the crooks, as all the wicked, all of them represented by one man. 
And he stood bearing all of that, all of that defilement before a holy God. And God sees his son and he unleashes all the terrors of his fury, vengeance and curses upon the head of his son. Because he stood in our place and he became a curse for us. A curse for us. The curse goes to Christ so that the blessing might come upon us. He receives the filth so that we might be dressed in his blessed righteousness. He was so cursed and we become so blessed. How incredible, how unfathomable is the love of God, is the love of Christ Jesus. With what more do you want me to encourage you about the love of God? What more can be said? What more can be done, Paul says? He loves us so much. He took our place. He took our place. And he became a curse for us. Do you not want to praise him? Do you not want to serve him all your days Do you want your love to flow only and ever only for him? This is the love of Christ. Now, as we wrap up, if this is what Jesus has done, how do we become the recipients of such blessing? How do we become the recipients of it? Look at verse 9. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Look at verse 11. Clearly no one is justified by God, before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. How do you get this? How do you move from cursed to blessed? By faith. It can only be by faith. After everything that we've done against him, after the enormity of his curses upon us, after the unfathomable work of Christ, it can only be by faith. Only. Did you see what he said there in verse 11? Clearly. Or your translation might say obviously. Clearly, a man is not justified by works, but by faith. The righteous, you will live by faith. If you believe Let me close with an appeal. If you are an unbeliever in this room, if you are not right with God, if you are not walking with Him, understand this. Understand this. You are under His curse. When you go home tonight, when you put your head on that pillow, you are under His curse. And when you rise to start a new day, you are under His curse. And when you commit to your work, you are under His curse. Everything that you do, every minute of the day, every breath you take is lived under the curse of God. And He will hunt you down in His good time. And as it pleased Him to bruise and crush His Son, He will delight in your ruin. You are cursed. And so I say to you, Christ is offered to you tonight. He was willing to become a curse for you. He was willing for that. Now, if you are to be a recipient of his grace, if you are to be a recipient of the blessing, you must be willing to come to him on his terms. He was willing to take the curse. Yeah, now you must be willing to come on his terms. And his terms are this. You must accept everything I have said about you. Everything I've said about you. Repent of all that you ever trusted in, all of your self righteousness. Plead for mercy and throw yourself upon me by faith, and you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. For the believer here tonight, you are, you know, when you read in Scripture, the blessed man, the blessed woman, that's you. That's you. That is absolutely you. Romans 4, 6 to 8 is referring to you. It says this, Blessed is the one to whom God credits righteousness. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. That's you. That's you. 
That is absolutely... So understand this. If you are in Christ tonight, when you go home and you put your head on that pillow, you sleep under the blessing of God. You sleep under the smile of God. All of your relationships are under the blessing of God. All of your actions, all of your endeavors, all of your ways in the Lord are blessed by Him. You sit, you live, you breathe under the blessing and smile of God. You are loved by Him, and He will fulfill that blessing one day, take you to be with Him, and blessing fulfilled, you will see Him face to face. And when we see Him, we shall be like Him. Let me pray. Father God, we... Lord, we left without words before your word. May you have the final say tonight. Father, we have only scratched the surface of what Christ has done for us, what you have done for us in Christ. I pray, O God, that you'd be pleased to reach into hearts tonight. I pray that sinners would be drawn to you, that any who are uncertain, those who have deviated from the path, those who are pursuing ungodliness, those who are pursuing the ambitions of self, those who are resting under your curse right now, I pray that you would save them. I pray that you would break down their pride and their hardness of heart. And may you win them to your beloved son. May you win them, win them tonight, I pray. And Lord, for your people who do belong to you, those who are dearly beloved by you, I pray that you would encourage them. I pray that you would strengthen their faith. I pray that you would use these truths of the glorious gospel to help them endure through trials, to help them endure through hardships, to joyfully take persecution, to preach Christ boldly without shame, and to live completely and utterly devoted to you. I pray that you may work this in your people that Christ may be so honored that he may be lifted up. Lord, may you send your blessing. Even tonight we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.